Okay, so in this video here, I am going to be talking about transporting plants. In general, in biology, when organisms reach a certain size, they do need a transport system. If you're very small, if you're a small algae or a very small animal, you can usually do by diffusion alone. But when you reach a certain size, because diffusion works best over very short distances, you need a transport system. So a plant like this needs to be able to transport the different things it needs around in its tissue. For a plant like this, it needs CO2 for a photosynthesis that it can take up over the leaves. It needs water, it's taken up by the roots, and it needs different minerals, which is also usually taken up by the roots. So it needs to be able to transport water from the roots up to the leaves, and in some cases, it needs to be able to transport the end products, amino acids, sugar, somewhere else. So you need a transport system in the plant to make it work. In the syllabus here, what you need to know are the two major parts of the plant's transport system, the saline and the floating. Um, and while it might sound a little confusing, um, it's quite easy when you know that they do two very different things. The saline are dead cells. They're all attached together as one long straw, um, which means there are no cell cores and they are made of lignin. So they are long and hard and they go all the way from the root all up into the leaves as one long straw, which means that they transport water only one way from the roots and upwards. So it's dead cells, it's one long system, it transport water and transport water one way. Our other system is the flow leaf. The flow leaf are living cells still and they have what we call sieve plates where they have a cell and they have like a plate with hole in it where they can transport materials over it. So it's still the, these long structures that goes through the plant but it's living it's made of cellulose, it's a lignin, and it has next to it here a cell with a cell core. So it's an active tissue, but it transports sucrose, sugar, amino acids, but it's able to transport it both ways. For example, during summer, when we have a lot of creation of carbohydrates in the leaves, it can transport from the top of the plant down to the roots. On the other hand, when you have a plant that's growing, you can transport the stored carbohydrates from the roots up to the active part of the plant. So it's a two-way transport system for sucrose amino acids. So now we talk about the xylem and the floating. Inside the plant, these are usually structured in what we call a vascular bundle a vascular bundle is a little bit like when you have all the cables in your home and you put them in the same place. The plant tends to do the same and then make this, this is a square section of a root. Where you out here have the cortex and then you have the endodermis. And inside here we have the xylene and the floleme together as these bundles. Again, remember the xylene transporting water one way and the floleme transporting sugar amino acids both ways. Now, when we think about plants, the transport of water is often what we remember as being very important. If you have plants, you have to remember to water them, otherwise they wither and die. So how is it that water gets transported in plants? Well, it's quite an interesting journey. First, we have here a drawing of what is a root inside some soil. On the root, we have what we call root hairs, which are these very thin structures, which provide us with a very large surface area. Inside them, we tend to have a high concentration of ions, and sugar, carbohydrates, and so on, which means that water will tend to move in here through the process of osmosis. If you can't remember osmosis, please go back and have a look at chapter 3 again. Once it's in here, it travels both 
through the spaces between the cell in the cortex and through the cells in the cortex until it eventually reaches the xylem. Once we're in the xylem, the water will move up. So, now we have water inside the xylem vessel. What is it that powers the water transport? What is the powers, the transport of water to the plants? Well, strangely enough, it is evaporation. The ability of the water here to evaporate from the leaves is actually what drives the, tra the transport of water all the way up. If we look at uh, the structure of plants, it is actually built to make sure that you've got a good water transport. Now, if you remember from chapter three, in general, water moves down the water potential. So in the soil, we have a high water potential and in the air above the leaves, we have a low water potential. But just because we have a high water potential in the soil and a low water potential in the air, it doesn't mean that the plants work. They still need some structures. And that is, we have the root hairs, which have the small uh, um, area, a lot of small areas where water can diffuse in, which all in all gives a large area. I, of course, mean they have a, a very short diffusion distance. Um, so they give a large surface area for diffusion into the plant. You have the xylene that function as a tube that can carry the water up to the leaves. In the leaves, we tend to have large surface areas, which makes evaporation easier. And we have the stromata, which are opening, that makes it possible for easy diffusion of the water vapor out of the plant. All this only works because water molecules have a high cohesion. It means they stick together. And to illustrate that, I will kind of make a, a short experiment here or illustration. This is a model, a model of a plant. The rubber ball up here that provides suction that is the low water potential in the leaf. This long glass tube here is the xylem. And then we have our roots. So when I then have water evaporating, you can see that the water molecules stick together. They flow together up. So even though I now remove here, the water molecules still stick together. They have a high cohesion. Because water is a polar molecule, the water molecules would stick together. And that means when there is a low water potential here, than here, they will travel together up the xylene and all the way up to the leaves. So we need the special structure of the plant and we need the special structure of the polar water molecule to make this work, but it does work. So let's have a look at how different environmental factors will affect the transpiration rate and thereby the water uptake of the plants. Here I have a badly drawn model of the plant. We have the leaves up here, we have the stem, the xylem here, and we have the root with the root hairs here. Of course, water enters over the root hair, moves into the cortex, moves into the xylem, moves up into the leaves where it evaporates out going from a high to low water potential. But if temperature goes up, evaporation goes faster. That is, I think we all tried that, you know, clothing dries quicker on a hot day. So the higher the temperature, the higher the evaporation and thereby the faster the transport of water. Humidity, on the other hand, if there's a high humidity in the air, it lowers the difference in water potential between here and here, which will make uh, the transport of water slower. Wind speed, if the wind blows faster, it will move uh, water vapor quicker away from the leaves and it will increase the rate of evaporation and thereby water transport. If there's a lot of sunlight, the plant will need to take up more CO2 it will open up the stromatas more and thereby it will also lose more water vapor and thereby have a higher rate of evaporation.
And then last we have water supply. If the plant is in a situation with low water supply, it will tend to close its stromatis more so it can limit how much water it loses. Because this is kind of a double-edged sword for the plant. It needs to lose enough water so we can move water from the root up here into the leaves and thereby also move the ions that are needed. But if it loses too much water, especially if there's not a, lot, not a lot of water in the soil, eventually it will dry out and die. So it needs to keep a balance between opening up to lose enough water and closing down. And this is a demand it also needs to share with its demand for photosynthesis. So it is quite a complex way to regulate uh, how much water you lose. Uh, remember that water is taken up by osmosis into the root hairs and travels up, but the ions we also need, the phosphorus, the calcium, the nitrate, there tend to be a higher concentration of these ions inside the root than outside. So how can the root hairs take up something if there's more in here than out here? Well, in that case, uh, we need active transport, which means we actually use energy to, to transport these ions into the tissue and then they travel up uh, into the plant, into the active metabolic tissue. So water travels by into here by osmosis and then the difference in water potential drives it from here to here, while the ions, they move into the plants due to active transport. So far, we have mainly talked about the transport of water, but we also need to talk about the transport of amino acids, sugar, fats, the other nutrients inside the plant. And here we have to uh, look at what, we, what I call the source sink model. Um, here's a badly drawn picture of this could be a potato. During the summer, up here at the leaves, we have photosynthesis happening at a high rate, which means there are produced more carbohydrates, more starch up here, also more amino acids that are needed. So they get stored down here in the potato, which means here during the summer, the leaf is the source and the tissue here underground is the sink. And then during winter, well, at least here in the temperate regions, Nothing happens. It's called as different in the subtropics and the tropics. But here in cold Denmark, nothing happens. The potato lies underground unless I dig it up and eat it. But then comes spring. And as you know, the ground heats up, we need to build a new plant. As a new plant is starting to grow here, the leaves are not that big and the sun is not that bright yet. So we move carbohydrates here then from the potato from the source and up into the leaf so they can start building the new tissue. So at that time here, the root is the source and the leaves up here are the sink. So this way we can change between one being the source and the other being the sink during the year. So just a little mention on how we move the other stuff around in the plants. And remember, the silent moves the water. So this movement here is done in the flow lean, where we move the amino acids, the carbohydrates, and so on. 